Hello, my name is Mike Loftus. I am the Objects Conservator at Norse Lofats Museum, the Norwegian National Aviation Museum. Today, we're going to be talking about preserving the unpreservable, what to do with time-limited objects, how to use them, and what is involved in trying to look after them. And I will be describing some of those procedures in detail, as it is a good form of therapy for me to share with you. I will be using three case studies to explore the life cycle of an aircraft displayed outside, and they are the 737-300, which is the star of the show. And this is one of my projects at Norse Lefaz Museum and represents new life. There will be a Comet 4C, a previous project at the National Museum of Flight, part of the National Museum of Scotland Estate, um, just east of Edinburgh in East Fortune. And this will represent life extension surgery. And a 707, also at the National Museum of Flight, and this will represent death and reincarnation. So what is my role in all of this? What am I trying to achieve in my position as an objects conservator? Well, I wish to minimize material loss so I can hold the object as close as possible to its used condition. And this is important because signs of its manufacture and witness marks from its use can tell you a lot about contemporary technologies, how it was used, the world in which it lived and the people it touched. Ultimately, the object treatment, as in what I have done to it, sets how the public see and interpret it. So should it be new and complete? Should you restore and reconstruct it to help with understanding? Or should you concentrate on stabilizing and preventing further decay? Well, the accepted rule is you start with the preventative measures, stabilize when necessary, and restore as little as possible to minimize the impact the treatment has on how the object looks. So what makes an object unpreservable? What are the agents of decay? And what can we do about them? In short, well, it's the outside with its wind, its rain, its so salty coastal air, massive temperature and humidity differentials, frost, ice, snow. In our position just north of the Arctic Circle, we get all of this plus a big dose of UV and visible light. Our city symbol is a flaming sun as we have the best average daylight hours in Norway. Our relatively short dark period is compensated by 24 hours sunlight in the summer, ensuring a good ultraviolet hammering. It is the outdoor environment, which is the biggest influence on the life cycle of an aircraft on outdoor display. It is not possible to cheat death and during your aircraft's life, it'll undergo heavy, aggressive treatments that will compromise the object's authenticity. Life expectancy of an airliner outside is around 30 years before you start to reach for the tin openers. Of course, we know the outdoors is not a great display environment, and they don't end up here by design, but by a necessity of their size. When your aircraft comes to the museum, it drops out of routine maintenance and inspection. There are no aviation technicians. There are no cozy hangars with all of the kit, and there is no well-stocked spare stores to source replacement parts we start to suffer cuckoo syndrome with an outdoor aircraft. The hammering of the environment is very quick acting with visible degradation happening um, almost immediately in sight of the public and your management. Your object starts to shout very disproportionately loudly, fix me now, perhaps pushing other more significant objects out of the way. So why am I clinging to conservation? Why don't I just submit to an easier life? Does it really matter? After all, an aircraft has countless replacements during its service life, can even have new wings, new engines. Does it really matter if the paint you're looking at is not the right type? After all, an aircraft is just one of many in a production line, just an example of type. Well, of course, my answer is yes, it does matter. As each aircraft leads the factory to lead a unique life, It'll operate in different environments, undergo modifications, have incidents and accidents through its life that will change the object. The individual components will bear the marks of this life and their removal damages the object's ability to talk to you, to tell you where it has been and how it has interacted with people. To mix histories or to make a Frankenstein object confuses the narrative. Every object should be treated as an individual case, but there are, of course, ethical guidelines that remain. 
I have experienced different rules and expectations depending on what your object is and what type of collection it belongs to. For example, these Norse era brooches I worked on in Museum Nanyel and in Stornoway, they are missing many parts, pins from the back and jewels from the front. And it would not be considered acceptable to take jewels from another one to make these more complete. The focus of the treatment here is stabilization with no restoration and no desire to send it back to the new. We have a duty as a museum to exhibit genuine artifacts, whether they be from Mesolithic or from the 1960s. The philosophy of minimizing material loss is as relevant to one as it is to the other. A quick dive into the ICOM Code of Ethics gives us food to thought on these issues and invites us to think about the definition of an authentic object. Collections as primary evidence. The museum collections policy should indicate clearly the significance of collections as primary evidence. Well, obviously, if an object is to be used as primary evidence, it must contain a high percentage of original material. Display of unprovenance materials. We are to avoid displaying or otherwise using material of questionable origin or lacking provenance. So the more you're mixing new parts into your object, you're degrading its provenance. Reproductions. Museums should respect the integrity of the original when replicas, reproductions or copies of the items in the collection are made. Well, you're not respecting your original if you're giving it new parts. And again, you are diluting it and moving it further towards a reproduction or, or replica. The position of conservation does start to look quite extreme and unachievable in the face of the outdoor display environment and its time limited life that it imposes on it. Is conservation the appropriate language or is a more relaxed approach required? Should we be talking in lines of uh, managing decline rather than conservation? But it is my core function to follow a professional framework. I am an object conservator, so I will always endeavor to preserve the unpreservable, even if it is difficult. But how is this relevant to us trying to find new uses? Well, if that new use is towards the interactive, we are still obliged by our code of ethics to engage the public with genuine culturally historic material. These objects are still objects and we do not evade our duty to preserve primary evidence. It may actually be more important in an interactive object um, that it has the um, layer of authenticity because you have a very primary direct um, relationship with it. So we will now talk about our case studies and how all of this affects uh, treatment. First up is the Boeing 707. Um, this aircraft represents death and reincarnation. It was born in 1960. And both of these photographs speak of a different time from the unrecognizable in-flight dining experience to the celebratory welcome it is receiving on the right. So there is a lot of information in this photograph referencing the colonial past of Britain, the opening up of the world, with the heralding of the jet age and the looming environmental disaster of climate change we are all now in. But we'll have to talk about these another day. The aircraft was retired in 1981 and it was displayed at RAF Museum Cosford until 2006. And spoiler alert, those 25 years outside were not kind to the aircraft. It had suffered corrosion that threatened its structure like here, we can see on the undercarriage in the top right. Um, and on the left-hand side is the ribs and stringers. This is inside the fuselage, the structure which um, holds it all together. And then on the bottom right, you can see exfoliating corrosion to an exterior panel. All of this was considered terminal by the owners of the aircraft, um, British Airways, and they decided to scrap it. But National Museums Scotland decided to keep the forward fuselage as it was the only surviving 707 in the UK. After its beheading, um, this is how it arrived in Scotland, a much more manageable chunk. The fuselage was stored for a few years and then it was sent away for a repaint. And here it is upon its return on its new transport and display frame. So the original paint has been removed in preference for a previous scheme more suited to the chosen curatorial theme. As a conservator, I see the paint it had as original 
historically accurate and in stable system, as in and stable, savable condition. I do not accept the imposition of a preferred previous narrative as justification for the removal of the original primary evidence. But now on to its treatment for the interior. This was stripped out as there was a lot of hidden corrosion and mold hiding behind the panels. The floors are made of aluminium um, and the corrosion had led to structural failure on certain load bearing capacity, not great for the public. And here is my at the time colleague, Darren Cox, um, helping with the strip out. Next came the rebuild of the interior. And here you can see in the middle of the photograph, the yellower floor. Um, this is Aerolam, a modern, strong, lightweight material developed for the aviation industry. Great though this material is, it is not contemporary to the aircraft. A rebuild of the floor may have been possible um, with the original specification, but not in the compressed time frame we had available for the project. The overhead lockers and the interior finish to the wall you can see on the right-hand side were made from original parts and donor parts from the scrapped aft section of the aircraft. Here we have the finished product, the port side left stripped back so you could see the aircraft structure and an interactive exhibition installed um, about aircraft development and the British Overseas Aircraft Corporation. And the starboard side was rebuilt to represent the in-service look of the aircraft, um, but with the clock turned back to the chosen earlier period with the seats reupholstered to match. So what can we say about this object? It looked very good at the time of completion and the interactive element was certainly enjoyed by the public. But of course, the price in material loss is great. This started with the loss of most of the aircraft, continuing with, with the loss of the original paint and the interior surface finishes to suit the previous narrative. The seats were intended to be used as cinema seats, so you could watch a documentary film about cabin crew life while sat in the fuselage. However, the losses continued here as the old and perished seat subframes would snap under the strain of their use and were regularly back in the workshop for um, rebuilds using donor parts. This is a finite resource, of course, as eventually you'll run out of seats. On the one hand, you can argue that the object has suffered a great deal of material loss. Much of the primary evidence has been lost, and it is too diminished to now be considered a museum object. However, on the other hand, it is still the only surviving 707 forward fuselage in the UK, and there is still a significant amount of material left. We can definitely argue that we have found a better use for this object than the scrapyard. The remains of it definitely provide a great platform for dissemination and engagement. But of course, my sticking point is the removal of primary evidence. So next up is our Comet 4C. Um, this could be the crystal ball into the future of the 737 and the life extension surgery it is going to require. This aircraft started life in 1962 with the RAF and was transferred to Danair in 1975, you can see on the right. Um, it was retired in 1980 and flown into the museum. I took these photographs in around 2012 and you can mean, immediately see there is ingrained dirt, organic growth and the delaminating corrosion which you can see on the right hand side there. Many windows had moss growth around them and the fire escapes were deeply pitted with corrosion. These were leaking, causing water ingress into the fuselage, which was causing molds to grow, uh, which is penicillin. And we had problems with corrosion inside as well, as you can see on this um, seat rail on the right hand side. Years of traffic up and down the um, aircraft um had caused the floor structure to fail um so it was a bit spongy to walk on and on the right hand side we have some more mold and this time it is in the air circulation system and this is present across the whole length of the aircraft so it was a full strip out and here are volunteers john and david vacuuming everything and wiping everything down with alcohol to kill the mold the fire escapes were removed for treatment in the workshop, 
the losses from the corrosion were built back up with resins. Um, the original door seals were replaced with plastic rubber compound. This is an epoxy, uh, two-part epoxy with inbuilt elastomizers, so it stays soft, uh, rubber-like. Uh, the same treatment was used on the window seals. In the top left, you can see the perish state of uh, one of the originals. And on the right-hand side, you can see the finished product door with the window pop back in and its new seal. I cannot talk about this project without mentioning our 15 minutes of fame. The papers loved our use of space hoppers to act as temporary weather seals. Uh, a technique, according to our volunteer John, was widely used in a nuclear power plant where he worked to uh, block pipes that were going to be under maintenance. Here we have our windows and doors back in. They look good, but we have lost the original paint due to aggressive anti-corrosive treatments to the door. Next was the rebuild of the damaged floor. Similarly to the 707, we used Airlam to achieve a quick and reliable result with a new carpet um, down the middle. Again, the finished product looks passable, but there is a considerable price again um, in terms of material loss. This is slightly countered by the treatment being theoretically reversible, as all of the original parts were kept. So um, theoretically, it can be returned to its pre-treatment state. But this is, of course, very unlikely to happen. Again, the, pro the problem here is the loss of the primary evidence and the introduction of modern materials that probably weren't invented at the time of use of the aircraft. So this is arguably no longer the object it once was. It's no longer the primary evidence reference um, that it once was. But what we have been able to do is facilitate and continue access and interpretation for the public. So now I am an expert, and this will never happen again. Uh, fast forward here to Buda, and in 2015, we collected this 737-300. And here we are with new life. This object entered service in 1989, became the first aircraft to be owned outright by Norwegian in 2006. It was retired in 2015 when it was flown to the museum in the paint scheme you see on the left. There is pressure to repaint it to its previous more flamboyant red nose scheme that you see on the right. I am predictably reticent, as there is as yet no conservation requirement to do so. Between 2015 and 2020, the aircraft was parked 1.2 kilometers away outside our storage hangar um, in the military airbase next to the museum. Um, as this was an active airbase at the time, there was no public access. And as you can see, there has been a cost recovery exercise by Norwegian as they have removed the engines for sale. As a side point uh, about high visibility projects, we got into trouble with V-Men, a popular magazine. Uh, Boeing scandal in Ibude, Rien Bort Million Gave. So they were accusing us here of hiding away our multi-million krona gift and not allowing the public to access it. But we had been very busy with visioning. Uh, we were thinking where is best to place the aircraft in relation to the rest of our estate and how will it integrate um, into the museum um, and also fundraising. We were also starting to think practically about how the object would journey to the museum from the airbase as we were going for a wings-on approach. Each circle or arrow you see represents a problem, whether that be a fence, a tree, a building, a weak road, a narrow road, or a drainage ditch. Luckily for us, the military have been the long-term supporters of the museum, and they offer to, take, um, to, to make things disappear or stronger as was necessary. Then came the construction of the display platform. I wanted this to be as close to 31 meters squared as possible. This is the length wingspan of the aircraft, um, as I didn't want any of it over grass, as this encourages higher humidity and more organic growth and more corrosion. We ended up with a platform of 22 meters squared, as every meter costs. But this is not a bad result. It's a good compromise. So the big day comes, and the journey begins. 
And again, we're lucky to have friends in the right places. Aviator, who were the guys at the airport who have the responsibility to move aircraft around there, turned up with one of their tractors. Here we are at Journey's End. Um, as you can see on the right, this is one of the temporary roads built by the military. We've kept the gravel section of this as a maintenance road. And on the left-hand side, you can see final positioning onto the platform. So you can see there is an enormous effort to deliver the aircraft just to this point. Um, and in a way, the story has only just begun. So why do you do this? Why do you resource um, a time-limited project in this way? Well, by having the object as a handling object, you open it up to good learning opportunities. And you can access normally out of reach places, certainly in an airport context, like the undercarriage bays and electronic bays, avionic bays. You can show people what's above your head, all of the um, emergency oxygen systems, for example. The aircraft has become a hands-on teaching aid for a technical school, um, and they share the museum building as all of the avionics, electronics, navigation, and hydraulic systems work. Um, so the students have a great opportunity um, to learn very directly. To make all of the magic happen, um, you need the right type of electricity, not the normal 240 volt stuff you have at home, but a 115 volt at 400 hertz. The reason for this is electrical components working on this type of electricity need less copper windings and are therefore lighter, a great saving on fuel in the lifetime of your aircraft. The magic is usually provided by an auxiliary power unit uh, in the aircraft, ours has been removed, or a ground power unit, the smaller grey box you see on the left next to the aircraft. But we now have our own permanent um, installation on the edge of the platform, which provides the electricity for whenever the school need it. Now the object is out of its inspection cycles. There's stuff that would usually be inspected like um, pressure vessels and um, oxygen system. This is, are the small canisters from the emergency system that feeds you with oxygen if you need it. Um, obviously we want to avoid oxygen leaks in confined spaces where we invite the public. So I've emptied all of these and um, after emptying, I've put them back again so the object is still as complete as it can be. Other pressurized systems include the emergency slides. These hold 3,000 pounds per square inch of pressure, and you don't want accidental release of these inside the aircraft. And here we can see John Warburton of the RAF Museum Cosford teaching one of their apprentices how to do this safely. Uh, we have hosted several work uh, experience placements for their apprenticeship scheme. And on the right hand side, you can see part of the fire suppressant system in the undercarriage and this pressure vessel again, that's nearly seven bar, well over 3000 PSI, also needs to be charged down, which we have done. The aircraft is changing its use to be more like a building and requires climate control uh, for preventative conservation reasons and of course to comfort people. Um, the aircraft already has systems that can do this. And here is a page, page from the maintenance manual showing the system of pipework that delivers air around the cockpit, passenger cabin and luggage hold. So I will need to tap into this rather than installing a complete new system. This is the air distribution manifold in the luggage um, hold beneath the passenger cabin. And this is the start of that system. So this is the manifold in the middle. I will be feeding it with dehumidified air that will be pushed around by a recirculation fan that lives here. This runs off the 115 magic electricity. I'll be replacing it with one that runs off 240 volt because it will be more durable and I'm not wearing out an original part. As a temporary solution, I have placed a dehumidifier in the passenger cabin. It needs two holes in the aircraft to function, an inlet and an outlet. So I have replaced one of the windows with an aluminium plate to avoid drilling original material. Once this is moved to the luggage bay, obviously I will set the cabin back, the passenger cabin back to its original state. 
As a nice reminder of the importance of humidity control, this is the dust accumulation in the same place we found it in the comet. Um, this is in the uh, air circulation system ductwork by your feet. Um, this will have a high organic content and it is made from human debris and will make excellent mold food. Condition outside, there is already exfoliating corrosion as can be seen inside the uh, starboard engine, the cell. Uh, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you are seeing a detail from the belly of the aircraft. Um, this corrosion is happening because of an internal hydraulic leak. Um, the oil itself is not corrosive, but when it runs down, it mixes with dirt and water and stays there. And this is corrosive. So it sounds um, very preventable. I can just go and wipe that off. Um, but it's a slow ooze all the time. I would have to be there on a daily basis. Um, we will have to fix the internal leak. Organic growth also starts quickly um, in a matter of weeks when the conditions are favorable in the summer. The paint has very poor adhesion. It's going to be a problem. Um, not much sign of a primer underneath. Um, I think I could just peel this like a banana skin. So sooner or later, I may have to submit to a clock reset paint job. In the meantime, I have started um, to patch the paint. Um, from a two meter distance, it looks okay. Um, but close up, you can see that it's not as thick. I haven't got the viscosity right. I haven't been able to match that lovely sheen um, of factory application. Another change for the aircraft um, is now that it'll be permanently parked in the same place. This sounds easy. You just put it there and you leave it, but it does prevent challenges. Once again, we can turn to our manual for inspiration. In the event of a storm or high winds, you are instructed to fully fuel your aircraft for added weight, point it into the wind, and if necessary, you take it to a parking area that has tie down points in the floor and use the system of straps and shackles called the flyaway kit to secure your aircraft to the ground. But of course, a permanently static aircraft will not be moved. Um, like this Nimrod in RAF Cosford Museum, usually would use a concrete foundation block underneath the undercarriage with these steel plates. You would tie it down with these big um, shackles and turnbuckles, um, all bolted down to the concrete. And you would put screw jacks underneath the jacking points of the undercarriage in between the wheels you see there to relieve the pressure on the tires, which will eventually pop. And you can see the poor state of our tires in the bottom right there. I would like to copy this, but we do not have concrete blocks underneath our uh, aircraft. We have compressed masses instead, which are difficult to bolt into. So instead I've come up with an alternative, which is to foam fill the tires relieving the need for pressure maintenance um, of the tires and relieving the need for these screw jacks as the tires will permanently take the weight. This will also allow the aircraft to move around a little in the storm force winds, soaking up some of that energy. So the wheels must be taken off and sent 1,200 kilometers south uh, for this to happen. No problem on a well-maintained aircraft and experienced ground crew check the manual. That looks like a procedure we can do um, fairly straightforward. However, we don't have ground crew. Uh, we don't have a well-maintained aircraft and we don't have the equipment. I made several attempts with old inadequate jacks that would just bleed out and slowly sink, not giving enough time to take the wheel off. But then Norwegian agreed to loan us this proper 20 ton axle jack that you see on the left. And it was a dream come true. We could now lift the aircraft high enough and long enough to take the wheels off. The wheels were a bit sticky. They did not want to come off because of all of the corrosion that you can see on the brake assembly. And we had to use hydraulic rams to get them moving. You can see that the brake assembly is made up of these um, series of discs and rotors, as they're called. There are six wheels on the 737, um, and they were to be removed three at a time. Um, and the weight taken temporarily by these axle stands in their absence. So three on, three off at any one time.
Normally, there is a short time between a wheel coming off and another going back on. After 12 hours, the discs of the brake assembly will start to slump as the hydraulics relax. They lose alignment, making wheel replacement more challenging as each disc must be manipulated by hand as you push the wheel back on. But here we see some technicians who are very well prepared for this and they are applying a spider to their brake assembly to keep the alignment. But of course, we don't have one of these. Here is an example of a wheel being put on. Um, now it is nearly 200 kilos, allowed to come back foam filled. It took four people and this wheel dolly jack to maneuver the wheel back over the brake assembly. So there is no written procedure for leaving your 737 for a couple of weeks outside on half of its wheels. It's only me that has said that this is okay. I think it's reasonable. I think I've arrived at here with logic and good decision making. But what if this and what if that? So there were a few nights of disturbed sleep while I was on half wheels. Of course, you don't always get things right. And of course, the last wheel did not want to come off. But by this time, I'm very, very far down the rabbit hole. I am committed to this course of treatment and this wheel's got to come off. So this led me to the, to the decision to pull it off with a forklift truck, um, which damaged the heat baffling um, inside the wheel rim. And in retrospect, I was lucky to not damage more components. But the wheels are now done. Let's move on to the engine. And replacing the engine or putting them back in is not only a cosmetic decision, but also helps secure the aircraft by shifting the center of gravity forward making it more difficult for the winds to lift the nose. So I have an engine um, which is donated by Aero Norway, but it has come flat back. But again, uh, we have friends in the right places. And luckily for us, Johnny Ulan, uh, who is an engineer of um, Aero Norway and a supporter of the museum, came to guide us through the process of building and fitting the engine to the aircraft which also provided a very good learning experience for some of the students from the technical school. And here we are adding components and sections one by one. Moving it to the aircraft and fitting it to the aircraft, we used a forklift truck at the front and a scissor table to support the back and lots of wooden wedges to fine adjust it. Here we are nearly complete cowlings up fan blades going in and here we have our finished engine with the air intake and johnny told us that it must be a world's first that never has an engine been built and fitted to aircraft so quickly with such little equipment which i think is a good thing but we are still not there we are still excluding the public we're still not ready for them so we still have this fence and after all, we have live systems in this aircraft, which must be protected. Um, and there are lots of hatches and doors which can just easily be opened, which lead to these hazards like high pressure hydraulics, for example. So the fence is not considered very pretty and will be removed. The consequence of this um, is I'll now have to go and lock all of these hatches and doors as there are no keys I'll be doing this by inserting barrel locks where I can or making up uh, L brackets, drilling out rivets and attaching L brackets and using padlocks to prevent handles being pulled out. Next issue will be access. At present, I have some very steep maintenance stairs, um, which are just asking for an accident. We can't really expect the public to use them. Um, uh, but I do have these old set of stairs from the airport, um, which have been used many times um, in service to take passengers on and off our aircraft as it was in service. But as you can see, it's a, quite a project in itself to bring these back to serviceable condition, lots of corrosion and lots of uh, paint work needing done. So it will be a strip down um, of these and a rebuild. Then after access is sorted out, um, there comes installation of 240 volt electricity, permanent lighting system, 
internet and other forms of onboard entertainment. Um, and as you can see, it is a great effort to bring an airliner to public use in the outdoors. And it will, of course, be using a lot of resource. And as a museum, we must understand the temporary nature of an object placed in such a display environment and invest accordingly. We must be prepared to use it and lose it. So I'm not saying that we should not collect them. And I am not saying um, that just because it's difficult, you shouldn't do something. But I am saying you should be very, very sure to collect the right objects. And to do this, you need very robust policies and procedures in place to make sure you are targeting the right objects. So you must be active rather than passive in your collecting. And you must know the use of your object before you get it. We have our own version of this, our own Norwegian version of this, um, but this is a significance um, grid, helps you to qualitatively assess the significance of your object based on significance 2.0. And this particular template comes from the Collections Trust. It goes through such things as condition, completeness, is there future collecting opportunities of another one? Um, are there expenses involved in it? Who actually is your object significant to? So targeting of the right objects leads to correct use of resource. So it's absolutely essential that you do this in preparedness um, for any object. Um, and because I think it is a criminal offense to end on a text slide, I thought instead we could have a helicopter ride in this Sea King over our uh, local mountain range of Bordevas Tinden. And we will be collecting this very helicopter in 2024 and it will be going inside which is good thank you very much for listening